cold silence that we don't dare speak. There's a wall between us and a river so deep. We keep pretending that there's nothing wrong. There's a cold of silence and it can't go on. I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix on the 18th of December 2008. There's always newcomers coming in for the first time. I advise them to go into CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com and download, if possible, as many of the talks I've given in the past as they possibly can because you never know. You just never know when we'll lose it or we'll get pulled or whatever. And when information is gone, it's gone. It's zap. It's finissimo. And you'll never get it back again. And understanding the big picture is of vital importance to make any sense at all of the changes we're going through today, how we got here, who's guiding it, and how we're guided truly by hundreds of NGOs that appear in little obscure write-ups in newspapers, and how it sinks into us that we're being directed, and we should go along with their directions. That's how it's portrayed to us by the mainstream media. These are private organizations that are truly not independent of each other. They're, they're all working together towards the same common goal. And it's not too pleasant, really, when you look at it. From their point of view, they think they're doing the world a favor. They want to truly depopulate all the unfit off of the face of the earth and have it all to themselves, all the better types of genes, and they'll have all the space and they'll be able to live forever and ever and use the resources wisely to sustain themselves. Also look into Alan Watt Sentient, sentinel.eu, and you can download transcripts of these talks, print them up, and you're done in the various languages of Europe, and pass them around to your friends. Information truly is the most vital thing you can possibly have these days, and that is why there's always been a war as to what information prevails. The mainstream media have had it their way for so long, and they've had us all trained from school and onwards to believe that everything they give us is the God's gospel truth. Most folk never, ever question it. They, they don't even reason through the process. They don't even ask themselves, how come these are official sort of organizations, these main news companies, very, very official in a sense, but they're still privately owned. Privately owned by what? By the power elite, by those who have already established the system and who rule over the system. You don't have to be, in fact, the people who rule over the system are not involved in politics. They just place the politicians in, but they're not, they're not really involved themselves. They plan on a much, much higher long-term level. And when you go in to do any search on the organizations that have the ear of governments. Remember, government's main job, really, never mind what they tell us or portray themselves as, their main job is to sign into law those laws which will affect us in our, all of our actions in everyday life. Therefore, those who tell them what to do, all the big lobbying companies, and you better believe it, there are big foundations as well, and non-governmental organizations which lobby full-time to get the government's ear, and they do get the government's ear. The average citizen cannot get that kind of meeting, even with writing to them and calling and so on. It might take you a year or two years before one minor bureaucrat will, will listen to what you have to say. But the lobbyists get instant access, and because they already have some kind of strange official standing that Masonic word again, standing in society or the community. Whenever they speak, they're listened to by these politicians who know there, that there is an organization above all of this that runs it through these organizations. They run the whole system. And I'll be back with more after the following messages with more of this topic. Alan 
Watt, and this is Cutting Through the Matrix, discussing the fact that the people, general population, don't sway the course of politics and decision-making by the politicians, but it is done by the big lobbying crowds and the foundations that fund them, and also the non-governmental organizations that are interwoven across the planet and who are funded by these big foundations who steer the whole world in a particular direction. And they've been doing this for an awful, awful long time. This whole sustainability project was started a long time ago, long time ago, and written about much, much earlier, in fact. And it's as far back as the 1800s, the big rich people of the world and their clubs, as they called them then, were discussing sustainability and the future. They were also into eugenics and, and discussed quite openly who should live, who should die, what kind of genes should be passed on, and, and so on. They also knew they needed a type of worker for the industrial era, which they understood would come to an end, and pretty well accurately when. And that those workers would be then disposable. They would have no more purpose. And it's no coincidence that since the handover of technology and the sponsoring, the paying of factories to move over to China to deindustrialize the West, it is no coincidence that the howl started at the same time about sustainability and overpopulation, aimed primarily at the West. And if you go back into all of the predictive programming we were given, predictive programming, remember, is mainly fiction. Novels, movies, series on television, which are all meant to get into your mind when you are relaxed and your guard is down, to get into your mind a possibility of a direction in the future, which will happen in your lifetime. And at the time as you're watching it, if you were to take someone away from TV or drag them away from TV, as you really have to do, and say, do you really believe that will happen? They say, no. And sure enough, You'll, you'll see it introduced into your life gradually, and you'll see that same person accept it quite naturally because they've already been downloaded with the possible idea of it. You see, if you don't, if you're sitting at a lecture, you can say, yes, I agree with this, I disagree with that in your own mind. But when you're being entertained, that sensor part, that discriminatory part of your brain is down, the shield is down, and you're concentrating on the plot, whatever human plot they push into a movie, you don't realize you're being, you're being programmed too with the whole theme, which is generally futuristic but not too far off, and massive changes coming your way, and they show you what kind of changes they're talking about. So when it happens in reality, you'll come to the conclusions, well, I guess this was somehow all inevitable, and that's called predictive programming. That's why the Hollywood directors and writers are, are given so much money so they're paid such big bucks because they're a, a very important task and that's the directing and guiding the culture and, the, and the, the, the direction of society Plato talked about 2,300 years ago how important the culture industry was to controlling people and guiding them on behalf of the elite and one of the movies that came out many years ago with Robert Duval was called THX 1138. It showed a society where people were drugged constantly and were monitored and watched everywhere they went, even in the bathroom. Even their drug cabinet had cameras in it that they give urine samples throughout the day to ensure they were taking their drugs and there were higher echelons of workers watching all the lower workers and monitoring their biorhythms and everything else. At the time, people thought, well, that will never happen, what a horrific show. Now, the writer of that book did not come up with that scenario himself because it had been discussed long prior to that, again, by people like... Huxley, Aldo Huxley, in the 1930s. 
who never changed his attitude towards the drugging of society. He was still going on about it in the 1960s. And I have the, the talk he gave at Berkeley in the 60s and touched on that very very topic. He says, well, what's wrong about drugging society? They're not terribly happy anyway. What's wrong? Meaning if the superior ones decide what drugs they should be, should be pushed on them and, and to be made to take, to make, as long as they were happy. You see, you understand their point of view and how they see humanity. They see humanity as just a, a collection of animals. They do see themselves, of course, as the most evolved types of those animals. So whenever they're talking about that, it's not really inclusive of themselves. It's about them, you know, those ones down there they're talking about. And he said quite constantly, they're not terribly happy anyway. And it's true because you look at society and there's nothing real in it. The whole culture, the whole structure of society was made. You were born into it. And who designed it? Someone did design it. It didn't just evolve by itself as they'd like you to believe. Culture has always been of prime concern of those who rule, to those who rule. So they make sure you're given the proper culture for the proper time that you live in. And it's always been that way. But to say, Huxley and others talked about the necessity to drug society. As long as they were happy, the animals would be happy, and that was all that mattered to them. To them, it was very simple. Make the animals happy. And use whatever means to, to do so. Then you can do whatever you, with them as you, as you wish to. Huxley also got turned on when he talked about his work at Tavistock. When they were inserting wires into mental patients' brains at the time. To make them alter their behavior. Or make them turn and move like a robot. And here you are pulling the strings as a guy in a white coat. That really excited them. What they could do with the, with the human animals really, really amazed him. And getting back to predictive programming, you see, we've had so much of this predictive programming. And I'll touch on the fact that the, the, the U.S. Psychiatric Association, many years ago, and the British one, they were heavily involved in pre-World War II eugenics programs because the whole psychiatry is based on defective genes and hereditary illnesses. They came out at the same time as, as, the, as the embryo of, of the, the geneticists with the same theme, that everything was due to inherited genes, including intellects. And it's very simple. You see humanity is a bunch of animals. How do you improve the stock of humanity well you eliminate those with the defective genes very very simple but what you do with the public in the process of eliminating them just make them happy as they're all dying off very very simple there's nothing complicated about this but what the elite always depend upon is a class of intellectuals and what they mean by an intellectual is not someone with original thought is simply someone who's been put into prominence by having so many degrees in a certain area and being pushed to the top and turning out a few books that are guaranteed to be successes by those behind the, the author who will push it and make it so. And I've, I've read studies before where they show you that the easiest people to influence along political correctness, no matter what they Part of the agenda is global warming, whatever it is, the easiest ones to influence are the better educated because they have a, an even stronger need to belong to their peer group, a strong need to be accepted. Therefore, whatever is in, in the little parties and get-togethers, whatever conversations are in, they will part them without question. They want to belong. Therefore, the intellectual groups, as they call themselves, are used heavily with all the non-governmental organizations, the so-called professional type people. And I'm going into this particular area of drugging society because we've had years and years of the a psychiatric association actually saying 
that most of society is mentally ill. And what they meant by that was we, we held on to what they called antiquated ideals. One was religion. Now you can, they're okay, you're okay if you accept the new age types of religions, that's okay. But if you hang on to the old religions, you're mentally ill. That was one point. If you believed in a family and having a mate for life, you're, there was something wrong with your head. And they wrote about this in great detail. You should read The Human Agenda, put out by one of, one of their protégés. This was also echoed by people like uh, John Dewey, who set up the American Educational Association and set up his mandate a long, long time ago. So where are we going with the drugs, the drugging of society? Look at all of the promotions we've had to get society on drugs of one kind or another. If you're upset, take a drug. If you're depressed, don't get to the root cause of the depression, or even if it's reactive. No, just take a pill. In other words, every side effect uh, of a happening in your life was of no relevance whatsoever as to the cause. Just take a pill to get rid of it like getting rid of warts. So now, your emotions now are just like warts. You have good ones and bad ones, good skin and bad warts. Just get rid of the bad warts. And that's what the drugging's all about. And we went to this to, with, to do with non-governmental organizations to see how they're pushing the drugs to drug the whole of society. And eventually it'll be done by a law. We'll be back with more after this break. I'm Alan Watts, and we're cutting through the matrix into the area of the mind and how the big boys, and I mean big boys, want to control the mind of every single individual. Because after all, we're not using it, are we? The old joke was that even in an age where organs are so freely available, the most expensive one is the brain. The reason being, when they put them on sale, it says brain for sale, transplant. Like new, hardly been used. That's a big joke. But here these guys are. Want to drug the whole of society. You know, these better types, these ones who've had an education and joined the right circles, who are funded and backed by the big companies, including the big pharma companies, that, that want them to push this stuff, and they're doing it quite willingly. So here's one organization that's dealing with this. Now that we've had years and years of tranquilizers being pushed out, I can remember when they pushed out the tranquilizers across Europe, aimed mainly at the British housewife or the French housewife and so on, and they started with the Valiums and the Libriums, they used to call them Mother's Little Helper, and they all got hooked on them. And for 20-odd years, 25 years, the makers of Valium, for instance, kept denying, and because they have so much input into the education of up-and-coming doctors, they trained them to, to say that it was all in the mind. And the doctors believed it too, even though they were seeing people coming in and having convulsions in the emergency room when they were trying to get off the Valium. Valium is a severe drug. It takes up to two to five years to leach out of your body once you stop it, because it lays itself down inside the long bones of the body. That was all known before they launched it on the market. But that's the power of them. They can keep it all quiet until it's all in your head for 25 or more years. But it doesn't stop them. And it's not just because they're greedy. There's an agenda here. You control society through big, real corporations. They're all integrated with the control of society. This article here ties in with the, the THX 1138 scenario because now that they've had us all so used to drugs and so on and so many children are now on Ritalin and other kinds of drugs it's time for the next step and try to get the rest of society in on the act and this is from Nature it's called simply Nature published online 7th of December 2008 it says towards responsible use of cognitive enhancing drugs by the healthy and 
has put out, these are the people who are on, I guess, the panel that put this thing together. Henry Greeley, Stanford Law School, California. Barbara Sahakian is at the Department of Psychiatry, University of Cambridge, and MRC-Welcome Trust Behavioral and Clinical Neuroscience Institute, Cambridge, UK. I wonder if it's a welcome pharmaceutical company that's backing that. It's cropping up all the time. John Harris is at the Institute for Science, Ethics, and Innovation. And again, welcome strategic program in the human body. Its scope limits in future. University of Manchester, Oxford Road, Manchester. Ronald C. Kessler is at Harvard Medical School. Department of Health Care Policy. This is health care policy. Boston, Massachusetts. Michael Gazaniga, the SAGE Center for the Study of Mind. SAGE Center, very nice, isn't it? For the Study of Mind, University of California, Santa Barbara, California. Philip Campbell is at Nature, 4 Crown Street, London, I guess is the organization, Nature. And then Martha J. Farah is at the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, University of Pennsylvania. So here's what they put out here in the abstract. It says, society must respond to the growing demand for cognitive enhancement. Did you know there was a growing demand for it? The last we heard of it was fairly recently, and I've read it on the air too, that the military have been into this for a while, to drug the troops to make them more efficient, and also have put out drugs there to wipe out memories of slaughtering people so they'll feel better about themselves. But they won't go for the whole society. Cognitive enhancement, apparently people are crying out for it. So that response must start by rejecting the idea that enhancement is a dirty word, like you Henry Greeley and colleagues. Remember they started with enhancement. I think it was, it was to do with breast implants. They called it enhancement. Then they jumped from there to all kinds of other enhancements. And again, enhancement, you see, is it's gonna, again, that's got a nice fuzzy feel to it. Enhancement is a good thing. It's like social. We're all social creatures. And they put it with socialism. So they use these, these, these terms for something really is rather ominous in reality. Today on university campuses around the world, students are striking deals to buy and sell prescription drugs such as Adderall and Ritalin. Not to get high, but to get higher grades, to provide an edge over their fellow students or to increase in some measurable way their capacity for learning. These transactions are crimes in the United States punishable by prison. Many people see such penalties as appropriate and consider the use of such drugs to be cheating, unnatural, or dangerous. Yet one survey estimated that almost 7% of students in the U.S. universities have used prescription stimulants in this way, and that on some campuses up to 25% of students had used them in the past year. And I think that's the music coming in. Yeah, it is. It's coming in a little, little bit. I'll be back with more after this break. You're listening to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Because you can handle the truth. Hello, I am Alan Watt, and we're cutting Matrix. I'm trying to point out the way that the agenda is introduced to society, at least the idea of it. And this is only the follow-up to the initial indoctrinations, which are through mainly fiction. It's always showing the Superman type, whether it's to do with having chips implanted in you, or cyborg parts or whatever. Now it's drugs as well. This is the whole agenda you see coming together from its different quadrants. And these experts, you see, these professional people, these intellectual people who all have seem, seem to have some sort of backing from the pharma agencies have decided in their wisdom that because so many students apparently, and of course they don't show you the studies, they just tell you what this, these studies that ever existed happened to be. It says up to 25% of students had used these drugs in the past year. 
Now, if 25% of the students had, had stuck cocaine into their arms, would that make it okay? Because that's how they use this argument here. These student trends are, are early adopters of a trend that is likely to grow, and indications suggest they're not alone. In this article, we propose actions that will help society. So we're going to be helped because we're too dumb and stupid to know what's good for us. To help us accept the benefits of enhancement, given appropriate research and evolved regulation. Prescription drugs are regulated as such, not for their enhancing properties, but primarily for considerations of safety and potential abuse. Still, cognitive enhancement has much to offer individuals and society, and a proper societal response will involve making enhancements available while managing their risks. Paths to enhancement. Log paths, you say. Many of the medications used to treat psychiatric and neurological conditions, and here's the spin on it, also improve the performance of the healthy. Have you walked through a psychiatric hospital? Have a gander. Have a gander through it. You can get in. And I have to see the people who have been there for quite a few years. And you'll see them with the little fantasine hops and different strange way they walk and the little the trumpeting sounds that the movements of the mouse they make and the trombone tremors, they call them. The tongues are always going. These are all side effects of the use of these drugs. But here they say this will improve the performance of the healthy. The drugs most commonly used for cognitive enhancement at present are stimulants, mainly Ritalin, with some amphetamine. Speed, you see, it's speed. <laughs> it says, and Adderall. And are prescribed mainly for the treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Which is, a, again, one of these new things that just came out of the blue. They don't know why it happened. We didn't have it before, then we had it. And I've, I've even got a, a good documentary here where you, you see the panel of psychiatrists at their annual meeting where they put these names into the psychiatric book. They decide it's going to be a disorder or not. And they asked the main character who'd advocated it to explain what it was. And, and the clock kept going round and round, and he couldn't tell you. It's so darn vague. But they've got half the children on it. It says here, because of their effects on the, on the catecholamine system, these drugs increase executive functions in patients and most healthy normal people improving their abilities to focus their attention, manipulate information in working memory, and flexibility, flexibly control their responses. These drugs are widely used therapeutically. Oh, it's therapeutic doping. You see? It's therapy. You can dope them for therapy, therapeutic reasons. It says, with rates of ADHD in the range of 4 to 7% amongst U.S. college students using DSM criteria. This is, their, this is their descriptions for is it a disease or not, or do they actually have this thing with ADHD? And stimulate medication, the standard therapy, there are plenty of these drugs on campus to divert to enhancement use. It goes on, towards responsible use of cognitive enhancing drugs by the healthy. Adderall is one of several drugs increasingly used to enhance cognitive function. A newer drug, modafinil, or also called Provigil, has also shown enhancement potential. Modafinil is approved for the treatment of fatigue caused by narcolepsy, sleep apnea, that's when you, 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 your, your breathing is improper when you're asleep, and they probably won't sleep at all when you're on it, that's just the thing. And, and shift work sleep disorder is currently prescribed off-label for a wide range of neuropsychiatric and other medication or medical conditions involving fatigue, as well as for healthy people who need to stay alert and awake when sleep deprived, such as physicians on night call. Are they telling us here that the, the docs on night call are all on speed? That's just what they're saying here. As well as for healthy people who need to stay alert and awake when sleep deprived. In addition, laboratory studies have shown that modafinil enhances, again enhances, aspects of executive function in rested healthy adults, particularly inhibitory control. Unlike Adderall and Ritalin, however, 
Modafinil prescriptions are not common and the drug is consequently rare on the college black market. Well, what a shame, eh? This is what I tell you, what a shame. But anecdotal evidence and a reader's survey both suggest that adults sometimes obtain modafinil from their physicians or online for enhancement purposes. Does that mean you've got a lot of crooked physicians out there that just dish this stuff out when they're asked? What are they saying here? A modest degree of memory enhancement is possible with the ADHD medications just mentioned, as well as with medications developed for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, such as Aricept. Now, what they're not mentioning at all here are the side effects of any of these drugs. Every drug out there on the market has a side effect, or more than one of them. And people who are trying to get off of speed, they crash. And they can become very aggressive at times as they're coming off of it and do incredible things to people around about them. But that's not even mentioned here. Because they'll, they'll eventually go into the next part, which will be to, to counterbalance it with tranquilizers. Now, what they used to call that uppers and downers, the cycle that people used to go through that tried this back in the, even in the, in the 50s, in the 60s and 70s. They were in a constant cycle of popping uppers and then downers, downers to get them asleep again. It says here, the ones such as Alzheimer's disease, such as Aricept, which raise levels of acetylcholine in the brain, several other compounds with different pharmacological actions are in early clinical trials, having shown positive effects on memory in healthy research subjects. It's too early to know whether any of these new drugs will be proven safe and effective, but if one is what is, it will surely be sought by healthy, middle-aged and elderly people, contending with normal age-related memory decline, as well as by people of all ages preparing for academic or licensure examinations. Human ingenuity has given us means of enhancing our brains through inventions such as written language, printing and the internet. This is how they always try to, to get you to accept something. Even the brain chip, they'll say, well, you know, an artificial leg is a prosthesis, you know. False teeth is a is prosthetic. So what's wrong with using this little chip here and sticking it in your brain? That's how they jump from this to this to this. Same idea. So from writing, the written language, printing, and the Internet, they're saying drugs should be used as well. I, I, I personally can't get the connection. Since most authors of this commentary are teachers and strive to enhance their minds of their students, both by adding substantive information and by showing them new and better ways to process that information. And we're all aware of the abilities to enhance our brains with adequate exercise, nutrition, and sleep. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You've been lots of exercise and you should put, if you get yourself on, on speed amphetamines, and you'll be a, you have a hell of a job getting to sleep. So the drugs just reviewed along with newer technologies such as brain stimulation and prosthetic brain chips should be viewed in the same general category as education, good health habits, and information technology, ways that our uniquely innovative species tries to improve itself. Of course, no two enhancements are equivalent in every way, and some of the differences have moral relevance, no kidding. For example, the benefits of education require some effort at self-improvement, whereas the benefits of sleep do not. Enhancing by nutrition involves changing what we ingest and is therefore invasive in a way that reading is not. The opportunity to benefit from Internet access is less equitably distributed than the opportunity to benefit from exercise, but cognitive enhancing drugs require relatively little effort, are invasive, and for the time being are not equitably distributed, they can't do it equally, just hand them out, because it's this darn thing that we call law and stuff like that. But none of these provides reasonable grounds for prohibition. Drugs may seem distinctive among enhancements in that they bring about their effects by altering brain function, but in reality so does any intervention that enhances cognition. Recent research has identified beneficial neural changes engendered by exercise, nutrition and sleep as well as instruction and reading. In short, cognitive enhancing drugs seem morally equivalent to other more familiar enhancements. So getting, getting stoned and drugged 
and hyper is equivalent to having a jog along some pathway or reading a book. This is what you get when you put these poems through educational courses and they really do believe that they're superior. I think we've all met in our, our lives people in work situations and so on that have swallowed all this. They truly believe they are superior beings because they've read all the right books and gone through their courses at college or university. And here's, here's where they go with it. Here's where they go with it. They all become little Hitlers and form the little associations and they think that they know better how society should be run rather than people in society themselves. The article says, many people have doubts about the moral status of enhancement drugs for reasons ranging from the pragmatic to the philosophical, including concerns about short-circuiting personal agency and undermining the value of human effort. Cass, for example, has written of the subtle, but in his view, important differences between human enhancement through biotechnology and through more traditional means. Such arguments have been persuasively rejected. And then I give you an example here. Three arguments against the use of cognitive enhancement by the healthy quickly bubbled to the surface in most discussions. That is cheating, that it is unnatural, and that it amounts to drug abuse. No kidding, it amounts to drug abuse. Well, isn't it drug abuse? What is the definition of drug abuse? It's something else we should really get into a debate about. But you know, our whole society, people don't even realize that the, the Olympic Games tie into all of this. Because the Olympic Games, people think, were established to bring people together from all across the world in sport. Again, anything that was to be global would, would help drive the agenda. But there was another main reason, too. Because when they were brought out, it was also to do with the attempt to create the Superman. Go back into its history. And we've had our whole lives long how they're all cheating and using drugs to run a bit faster than the guy next to them. Doing amazing things to, to make it happen. And suffering the consequences along the way later in life. So we've all been conditioned through different means that drugs, all these drugs are good for us. And all these pharma companies are good for us. You have to go in to the whole eugenics movement to understand what this is all about. You have to go into the history of psychiatry to know what this is all about because it was founded on the premise of unhealthy genes and the fit and the unfit. It was also premised on, on the need that most folk are simply below par. They're too inadequate. Most common people are, have not evolved enough. They have defective genes in them. And psychiatry came out with the intention initially to reshape the world. Look into its history. You'd be astonished at what was said back then. I got all the old tapes, in fact, of the early psychiatrists who belonged to the Eugenics Association, boasting about as they get rid of the unhealthy genes and get all these unhealthy elements out of society, they would then concentrate on breeding Superman. This was happening in England and in the U.S. before it was happening in Nazi Germany. Although most psychiatrists in Germany did join the Nazi party because their philosophies were so much the same. So, I'll leave that link up on the site when, I, when I'm finished tonight's show. We'll go to the callers now, and we'll go to Dave from California. Are you there, Dave? Hi, Alan. Hello. Uh, good to talk to you again. You always cover so much ground. Um, I had a question for you about the 30-year riots that you mentioned uh, with uh, Alex Jones the other day, but uh, I'd like to make a brief comment on Aldous Huxley. Okay, well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that, that speech you refer to is the one called The Ultimate Revolution, and it was in 1963 at the University of Berkeley. Is that Berkeley, correct? yes, on my site, that one. Oh, cool, okay. And uh, he said in that, in, in that, I'm paraphrasing, 
that he felt we were already far down the road to Brave New World in 1963. Yeah. Uh, and also that uh, he also commented a little bit on the ease of, hip of hypnotizing 20% of the population of the world mm -hmm. to be literally hypnotized with the snap of a finger. Yeah. And that 60% uh, this could uh, be hypnotized given greater or lesser amounts of effort, and there were 20% who could not be hypnotized. That's right. That's what he said, yeah. Yes, and, and I'm thinking that probably that, that uh, scale has slid more toward the uh, the ease of hypnosis with all the uh, television. That people uh, oh, I'm certain. I'm certain it has, absolutely, yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, and uh, George W. Bush said, you can fool some of the people all the time, and those are the ones you want to concentrate on. Thinking mm -hmm. that might be that 20% he was talking about. Yeah. But uh, the 30-year riots. Uh, do you see us uh, perched on the the beginning of the 30-year riots now? And and what uh, what be, what comes after that? After it, they hope to have stabilized the population in the world. I was going through. In fact, I'll read it tomorrow night probably. Okay. Uh, an army defense document uh, and projected uh, global uh, populations by the year 2030. And uh, they've got every, every nation uh, with charts down in this particular survey, and they see the drastic decline uh, after 1930, uh, after 2030, across the whole planet, including China. And they give all the reasons as to the whys. And they already said that, that Europe uh, already uh, is beyond sustainable reproduction limits uh, as far as the original peoples uh, go. So. Uh, this is all uh, tied together, absolutely. But they're also going in to, to create the new type of man on the way as we're all dying off. And that's the genetically enhanced type that will serve them better. I'll be back with more of this after this break. Hi, folks. I'm Alan Watt, and we're cutting through the Matrix. And we've got Derek from New Hampshire there. Are you there, Derek? Alan? Hello? Yes. Hey, how are you doing? Not so bad. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention a little bit about the books that you, you mention often on, yeah. uh, on your show there. Uh -huh. I, I just recently got um, The Next Million Years uh, yeah. through the library. You know, if you go to the library, uh, chances are they won't have it, but maybe another library within the state will have it. And they'll send it your library it. loan. Yeah, you can get a loan. Yeah, yeah those are great. I, I've re I read Between Two Ages and uh, another book from there uh, in that method. But in, um, in that next million years, he, talk, they, they talk, he talks openly about domestication of, uh, of us. That's correct, yeah. And, uh, and uh, keeping them themselves, like, uh, wild. That's right. They, mm -hmm. they, they stay preserved. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, I just want to let your maybe your newer listeners know that these books are still out there. I, I mean, I found a copy of Between Two Ages uh, for a buck at a yeah. flea market. Mm -hmm. And you know, you look at, you look on some of these sites, and you know, they're they're selling for four hundred bucks. Or maybe they're not selling. Maybe they're just sitting there. Yeah, they're sitting waiting to see someone will grab it for that money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, but people, you're right. Enough. But people do neglect the library. And right. Yeah. Going, the yeah, library. If you're going to wait a month or so, you they can go and do a search and bring it from somewhere else and, and to you. Sure. Yeah, donate them, you know, give them like three bucks, five bucks, whatever you got, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but also these books are, the, if you're having a hard time understanding, and if you can, like you say, stay awake during, during the book, and, you know, try and, try and, try and get to those, those gems, yeah. uh, it's going to come together an awful, awful lot quicker instead of. It, it does, and then you also see that this man isn't speaking just on his own behalf. He's speaking for massive, huge organizations that were up and running in his day. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely get out there and hit like like I hit all the antique stores and I've 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 found like I I found half a dozen copies of Brave New World Revisited. Yes. Which you you can still get that brand new, but yes. if you're going to pay 50 cents, why you know, why not pay 50 cents? Mhm. Mm and also I want to mention a a, a a I guess predictive programming book I've been I just stumbled upon it. uh it's sci-fi, it's John Christopher's Tripods trilogy. Mhm. Mm uh, yep. Right in there, they, they talk about the world about a hundred years after today. Yes. And how these giant tripods, which I I I only see them as like the cell towers, really, mm -hmm. except they they're mobile. But everybody everybody is is capped with like a mesh thing on their head, which would would, would be the brain. And, and that's exactly what Arthur C. Clarke, uh, one of the big uh, 
uh, authorized sci-fi writers uh, put in his last book, um, I think it was uh, 3001, his very yeah. last novel. They would have this little ring on their heads and, uh, and, and they're all connected with each other and no one can do anything independently and all the rest of it, yeah. Yeah, and a side note, too, I read The Profiles of the Future by Arthur C. Clarke, and he talks about weather control by 2010. Yes, he was up there. He didn't dream this stuff up himself. He was a member of the Futurist Society, mm. and the big boys gave him the information like to do with them all and tell him to write a story around it. And the youngsters, it's very enticing. You lap it up, and you oh, yeah. realize you're being programmed to expect this happening in your life, and it's all quite natural. Yeah, yeah these, these Tripods books, are exact, they're, they're geared toward the adolescent crowd, and, and they go into, like a big part of it is there's the annual games, which reminds me of the Olympics, yeah. and, the, and the winners go in to serve happily those, those Tripods in their cities, their great cities. Yes. And, and another great book by John Christopher, it's, a, it's, it's called The Guardians, and it's... That it's, is uh, right, yeah, I've seen that one. It's yeah. a great one. They, they have the habitat areas and inbreeding and all that. <laughs> That's right. They got it all there because the future's already written out for us if we go along with it. Yeah, we, we can. So that's that's the, the end of the show for tonight, and then comes the music. So from about 25 below, up here in Ontario, Canada, from Hamish myself, it's good night, Emmy, your God, all your gods go with you. <laughs> 